Hello and welcome to Byju's IAS presenting to you the daily quiz for 13th of August 2021. Let us begin and have a look at the first question for today. Which of the given statements with respect to Central Vigilance Commission is or are correct? The CVC was established as a statutory body on the recommendations of Santhanam Committee. The Central Vigilance Commission is controlled by the Home Ministry. The Central Vigilance Commissioner is appointed by the President on the recommendations of a committee consisting of the Prime Minister, the Home Minister and the Leader of Opposition in the Lok Sabha. What is the context? In this article in the Indian Express newspaper today, Mr. S.Y. Qureshi talks about the need to curb criminalization of politics. That is, the need to curb the participation of criminals in politics in India. The Supreme Court has taken various steps like ordering the disclosure of criminal antecedents of the candidates that are yet to take part in elections. But Mr. Qureshi argues that concrete measures have not yet been taken to stop these candidates with criminal history in contesting in elections. He states that the reason given by political parties to not disallow those candidates with criminal history in taking part in the elections is the maxim of Indian law which says that any accused is innocent until proven guilty. But earlier, the Supreme Court had annulled the appointment of Central Vigilance Commissioner on the ground that a criminal case was pending against him. Now coming back to the question. The Central Vigilance Commission was set up in the year 1964 on the recommendations of the Committee on Prevention of Corruption that was headed by K. Santhanam Correct but it was established through an executive resolution and not as a statutory body. Later in the year 2003, statutory status was conferred upon the Central Vigilance Commission. Therefore, statement 1 becomes incorrect. The Central Vigilance Commission is not controlled by any ministry or department. It is an independent body which is only responsible to the parliament. So, statement 2 also becomes incorrect. So, the Central Vigilance Commission consists of a Central Vigilance Commissioner and not more than two Vigilance Commissioners. How is the Central Vigilance Commissioner appointed? A committee with Prime Minister as the Chairman, the Home Minister and the Leader of Opposition in the Lok Sabha as members make a recommendation for the appointment of a Central Vigilance Commissioner. And he or she is appointed by the President on the recommendation of this particular committee. Therefore, statement number 3 becomes correct. The answer to our question would be option B, 3 only. Moving on to question number 2. Global stringency index in news is option A, a qualitative measure of regulations in place for businesses and protection of property rights in a country, an annual assessment of countries' press freedom records, Option C, a measure introduced during the COVID-19 pandemic to evaluate how strict a country's policies and curbs were and at what stage of the pandemic spread it enforced these. Option D, a measure evaluating the level of liberalization of a country's economy. Let us first have a look at the context. The COVID-19 pandemic has given rise to the largest education emergency in the world. And this article in the Hindu newspaper today talks about how the pandemic has affected formal education in India. This article states that the Global Stringency Index has tracked the closure of educational institutions across all the countries since the beginning of the pandemic. We will discuss more about this indicator while we discuss the answer. The article states that in India, a significant majority of the days between March 2020 and July 2021 saw the most severe policy response that required the closure of all types of educational institutions. This was as compared to other countries that took measures to keep the schools functioning. And they had various different approaches to keep the schools functioning. Now, the article suggests that India should also take measures for opening up of schools and this should be based on the pattern of the outbreaks of coronavirus in different parts of the country and a uniform policy for opening up of schools is not the best way forward. Coming back to the question, the stringency index was created by Oxford University. It shows how strict a country's measures were to curb the pandemic and at what stage of the pandemic did the country enforce these restrictions. So this index is based on nine response indicators including school closures, workplace closures and also travel bans etc. 
So the stringency index is a number between 0 to 100 and a higher index score indicates that there was higher level of stringency in the country. And as per this index, India imposed strictest measures much earlier than many other countries. In May 2020, India's stringency score was as high as 74. But here, please note that a high stringency score does not mean effective curbs. The index only records the strictness of government policies and does not measure if the policy or the curbs were appropriate or effective. Therefore, the right answer to our question would be option C. Moving on to question number 3. Which of the given statements is or are correct? The constitution of India gives the government right to levy taxes on individuals and organizations. The seventh schedule of the constitution puts separate heads of taxation under union, state and concurrent lists. The union and the states do not have concurrent power of taxation. A state legislature may by law authorize a municipality to levy and collect taxes. What is the context? The government recently decided to withdraw retrospective taxation amendment that was introduced in the year 2012. And in this context, the government has stressed the need to establish the sovereign right to taxation. So what is the sovereign right to taxation? In India, the constitution gives the government right to levy taxes on individuals as well as organizations. But it also says that nobody, not even the government, has the right to levy or charge taxes except by the authority of law. What does this mean? Whatever tax is being charged has to be backed by the law that is passed by the legislature or the parliament. Any tax that is levied by the government which is not backed by a law or is beyond the powers of the legislating authority will be struck down as unconstitutional. So the tax is not a voluntary payment but it is a payment enforced by a legislative authority. And this is the sovereign right to taxation. Now coming back to the question, statement number one is correct because according to the constitution of India, the government has the right to levy taxes on individuals as well as organizations. Coming to statement two, so we know that the seventh schedule of the Indian constitution distributes legislative powers that also includes taxation between the parliament and the state legislature. Correct? But it puts separate heads of taxation under the union and state lists only and not under the concurrent list. Therefore, statement number two becomes incorrect. Statement number three is correct because the union and the states do not have concurrent powers to taxation. It is either in the state list or in the union list. And this cannot be taxed by both the state and the center concurrently. Statement number four is also correct because through the 74th constitutional amendment, provisions have been made to allow levy of taxes by municipalities. A state legislature can authorize a municipality to levy, collect or appropriate taxes by a law. Therefore, statement number four is also correct. The right answer to our question would be option A, 1, 3 and 4 only. Let me know in the comments section if panchayats can levy or collect taxes. Now let us move on to question number 4. Which of the given statements best describes the Munro Doctrine? A revenue rule introduced by Sir Thomas Munro as the governor of Madras in 1820. A US foreign policy regarding domination of American continent in 1823. A US military doctrine towards China and East Asia crafted in 2018. Annexation policy applied by the British East India Company in India until 1859. What is the context? This article in the Hindu newspaper today has a reference to Munro Doctrine. So what exactly is this Munro Doctrine? This was a foreign policy of the United States of America introduced by James Munro in 1823. President James Munro introduced this foreign policy regarding the domination of American continent. It stated that if European nations tried to colonize the land or interfere in American land, it would be viewed as an act of aggression that would require US intervention. Therefore, the right answer to our question would be option B. This Munro doctrine also becomes relevant for international relations because some time back, Nepal and Bangladesh had blamed India for the use of foreign policy that was similar to Munro doctrine. 
They said that India was using its muscular strategy and interference in the internal matters of their country and also that India was trying to protect its neighbours from the influence of China and Pakistan. Now let us take up a previous year question from prelims paper 2017. Which of the following objectives is not embodied in the preamble to the constitution of India? Option A. Liberty of thought. Option B. Economic liberty. Option C. Liberty of expression. Option D. Liberty of belief. If we have a look at the preamble to the constitution of India, we can see that it mentions liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith and worship. But there is no mention of economic liberty. Therefore, economic liberty becomes the right answer to this question. Now let us take up the fact of the day for today, revamped distribution sector scheme. This article in the PIB talks about the steps that the government has been taking to bring DISCOMs, that is the power distribution companies, back on track of financial sustainability. So this scheme has been launched to improve the operational efficiency as well as financial sustainability of all the government power departments so that it will make sure that there is quality and affordable power supply to all the consumers. So this is a reforms based and result linked scheme in a sense that the assistance provided to DISCOMs will be based on meeting pre-qualifying criteria as well as upon the achievement of certain basic minimum benchmarks. So the scheme provides for annual appraisal of these DISCOM's performances against a predefined trajectory. So if the DISCOM has performed well, that is, if it has scored a minimum of 60% of the marks, only then will it be eligible for funding against the scheme in that particular year. So the nodal agencies for the implementation of the scheme are Rural Electrification Corporation and the Power Finance Corporation. So what are the objectives of this scheme? The objectives of this scheme is the reduction of AT and C losses, that is, reduction of the operational losses due to inefficient power system by 12 to 15 percent by 2024 and 25. And the next objective is to reduce the cost revenue gap to zero. The scheme also aims at developing institutional capacities for modern DISCOMs. That is, it will provide conditional financial assistance to DISCOMs for strengthening the supply infrastructure. The next one would be improvement in the quality, reliability and affordability of power supply to consumers. And this will automatically be achieved when the DISCOM or the power distribution sector is financially sustainable and operationally efficient. So what are all the steps that are being taken under the scheme? One of the path-breaking interventions under the scheme is the plan to install prepaid smart meters. Prepaid smart meters will be installed to all the electricity consumers except for agricultural consumers in a phased manner. And almost half of the scheme outlay has been committed to this particular intervention. The next intervention is providing funding for feeder segregation of unsegregated feeders. The third focus of the scheme is on improving the electricity supply for farmers and for providing daytime electricity to them through the solarization of agricultural feeders. So under this scheme, work of separation of 10,000 agricultural feeders will be taken up. And how will this benefit the farmers? Through this, the farmers would get access to dedicated agricultural feeders. And through this, they will be provided reliable and quality power supply. So please take note that this scheme converges with the Pradhan Mantri Kisan Urja Suraksha Yojana which is PM Kusum scheme that aims to solarize all the feeders and provide avenues for additional income to the farmers. Another important step being taken is that the scheme will also make use of artificial intelligence. So artificial intelligence will be used to analyze the data that is generated through the IT and OT devices such as prepaid smart meters. So these reports will help the DISCOMs to take informed decisions on loss reduction, demand forecasting and also for other predictive analysis. So this scheme is not only expected to improve the financial sustainability and operational efficiencies of DISCOMs but it is also expected to ultimately promote the development of startups in the distribution sector across the country. That is all for today. Thank you for being with us. Keep watching and keep learning.